I see the hour is upon us, and so let us prepare our hearts to worship this morning. I'm Reverend Davin Ospik, the pastor of Christ Church, where we continue to seek to make connections and offer opportunities for faith, love, and service. We're trying to embody this purpose that God has laid upon us to the best of our ability through these times, largely that has been online at this point, through our Facebook page, our YouTube channel, uh, and on our website, which is ChristChurchAmherst.org, which also can link to those other things if you've not had a chance to check those out. It's hard to believe for me that the last time that we shared Holy Communion together was the beginning of March. That was the last time that we had Eucharist. I'm happy to report that the first Sunday in September, we will once again be having Eucharist as part of our worship service. Obviously, this has to be done in a very different way at these times. And so for those who are going to be worshiping online uh, and at home, plan ahead. Have some bread or some juice there so you can participate at home if you will be worshiping at home. For those present here, there will be an individualized sealed communion kit. That's the best way that I can explain it. That you will pick up on your way in. And we will collectively take communion together, you at your respective seats, myself up here at the table, when we arrive at that point in the liturgy. I'm going to make a video this week, and it will be on our YouTube channel, that will introduce you to these little communion sets. Uh, because it's new for me, and I'll admit that I dragged my feet and kind of kicking and screaming adopted this as a way to have Eucharist because for me a big part of the theology the way that God speaks to us is how we are connected together through one loaf and one cup that that is part of the symbolism of Eucharist and so using these hermetically sealed individualized um, communion realities take away from some of that but I understand the value and import importance of encountering God through sacrament. And so this will be the way that we do it. So look on YouTube for that introduction this week ahead. Uh, I also am going to restart some of the history videos, which I was doing earlier on in this. I have a host of material to get through. And so if you have enjoyed some of the tours and history that was in the past, there will be some new ones of those will be introduced uh, this week. We are working hard. We have a September newsletter coming out, the caller. There's a lot of that that we don't have full detailed information. So we have our aspirations and our hopes for the programs and things that we will be doing. Many of those will be online or virtual. Some of those we hope to be in person. Anything that is in person will also be hybrid. It will have the opportunity to participate online, whether that's at the time that it's offered using our YouTube live channel or our Zoom um, platform, a Zoom meeting for those who have participated in that, or whether it's recorded and made available at a later time, which is largely what we have done to this point. So we, we're not sure on some of those things, and, and all of us who are living through these times understand that there's a lot of this uncertainty, uh, and we navigate these turbulent waters together in this time um, and we will do our best as we uh, offer those opportunities to share what the, the means are of them. But look, we are looking forward to that. We are planning for the fall. We are planning for more. And I think this is a vital time for all of us to connect deeply into our faith. And so I encourage you as we come to the fall to look for something to anchor yourself to through these times and, and perhaps pick on something new. We're going to do an all-church read starting um, a little later in the fall. We already have the books, uh, and so that's something also we can do remotely, uh, but will be part of the sermon series and other things. Anyway, thank you for joining me in worship, those who are physically present, those who are online with us as well. Let us invite the Holy Spirit to come and be among us as we worship together this morning.
I'd invite those present to stand as a way for us standing before God as we open our hearts to worship and join me in this call to worship. Over the turbulent waves in our lives, Jesus calls us. But we are so busy watching the waves tossed back and forth, we block out Jesus' call. Look and listen. Jesus is calling. Can we trust it? We're so true. Do we dare? Do not be afraid. This is the time and place to take the step of faith. Lord, be with us as we reach out to you and to others. Thank you. This is a season, typically, but it seems like this year even more so, of unsettled weather. From tropical depressions and storms and hurricanes, tornadoes, derechos. How's that one for a new one, huh? Who's heard of that before? Fires, fire tornadoes, I read about this morning. And general heat. Had enough heat yet this summer? Seems like every time we get past one heat wave, another one follows. And you would think that I would just be talking about natural phenomena. The weather around us, the outside. But this is what it feels like inside. This is what it feels like in our lives. Depression and storms, hurricanes of uncertainty, tornadoes of challenge. It hardly feels as if one storm passes before another one is upon us. One wave crashes as another crests behind it. In the sense of wanting just to be past, to be out of the wind and the storm, we're ready to step off, just stop another lashing of the wind against us, hide from it. I pray we may all listen for the voice of Jesus. Take heart, he says, have courage. Do not be afraid that we might find ways to connect. We might seek opportunities to reinforce our faith, to bind us in love as we navigate these waters together and in service 
to all. So let us batten down the hatches, as they say, because the seas that we are in are rough seas. But by faith, by faith, we hear Jesus. Have courage. It's going to be okay. Also, the following prayer concerns individuals and situations who are dealing with specific storms have come up that I wish to bring to your attention. Jim Pollard was hospitalized this past week, but he is out of a hospital and back home. Home is now a new home. He and Sally moved to a new home just recently, uh, just about a week ago, uh, and so is happy to be home and settling in to that new home. Dave Mitchell also was hospitalized this past week. He is in the hospital still this morning. He is hopeful to come home today, but there's still so much uncertainty surrounding both why he was admitted into the hospital and as he leaves the hospital that it is a challenging time and our prayers are with Dave and with Barb as she also is as frustrated as can be uh, through this time, just wanting him to have relief but her also to have relief from him. <laughs> Bill Swenson. Bill is nearly 100 years old. Bill fell and broke his leg. And you can imagine how devastating that is for him. Um, the challenge for Bill is not only the recovery from that, but Bill has a cat that he keeps for company at Amberley. And that cat is in need of a foster situation while Bill recovers. If you would be willing or you know someone who might be willing to foster Bill's cat, Amberly is providing a temporary care of that animal in his absence. If you could talk to Sandy after the service or if you're worshiping online, if you could contact Sandy Cumming, um, she has the ability to connect those things together. So I'm going to leave that in her hands. And I know that would provide Bill the ability to focus on his healing and not worry about other things that are happening. We also, of course, pray for those who are recovering or in the midst of natural challenges and storms. Like I said, I read headlines this morning in fire tornadoes. As soon as I learned the term derecho, which is something that afflicted where my peoples are from in Iowa, I learn of new things with fire tornadoes and so many that are trying to put back together the pieces of their lives following on these, these phenomena. Let us now turn to God in a time of prayer. Let us pray. Not in the wind and not in the earthquake and not in the fire were you present, O God. But where we least expect you, in a voice that whispers in the heart's deepest silence, in a call to venture forth against all reason and odds. And yet rather than listening to that whisper in the depths of our heart, we instead tremble in fear against the wind and waves of life and ask for more. Is it your voice? Can we be certain? Forgive us, O oh God, and reach out your hand to us of little faith once more, that we may take heart and not be afraid. And we hear the good news that you do forgive us, reaching out to us in grace. So now open our eyes more fully to your presence at every moment of history and in every circumstance of life that we may face all times of testing and turmoil with Christ, leading us toward safe haven and true peace. You have called us in the turbulent seas of life to be a people of prayer, to continue the ministry of intercession handed on to us by Jesus Christ himself. And so we come before you with confidence, bringing our prayers for the world you love. We pray that in your mercy you will hear and answer. 
So we pray for those who, like Jesus' disciples, find themselves surrounded by high winds and stormy seas, those who feel overwhelmed by events and circumstances and who don't know where to turn. We pray for those who, like Peter, are experiencing a crisis of faith, who long to wholeheartedly trust in God but are held back by questions and doubts. We offer our prayers for all those who hunger and thirst, those who live in the midst of violence or poverty, and those who feel abandoned or ignored by the world around them. Through the life-giving power of your Holy Spirit, make your sustaining presence known to all who are in pain or need, so that they too may know your love and live. Give us all courage to persevere in faith, and the obedience to trust in your leading even when we cannot yet see the outcome. May we not grow discouraged with the winds and waves against us, but take heart in Jesus who will see us safely through. Make us worthy to bear your name. So it is that we lift these, all of our spoken prayers, along with those that remain unspoken and yet weigh on our hearts, unifying our voices as one as we pray for the coming of the kingdom as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us for our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the Please be seated and let us open ourselves to God's presence as we prepare to hear the word today. God of all power, your sovereign word comes to us in Christ. When your church is in danger, make firm our trust. When your people falter, steady our faith. As we hear this word today, show us in Jesus your power to save that we may always acclaim him as Lord who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Our scripture this day comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew, and this is in the 14th chapter. It's part of this summer sermon series, which is scriptures that have been submitted by all of you online or here present. Uh, that are ones that are beloved by you or challenging to you. I've got a few more left in this series. I think the most difficult one is the final one of the series, which I am greatly struggling with, which is the, the first Sunday in September, a passage from Revelation. So you might imagine why the struggle is there. This one is a little less of a struggle, uh, as it is a story which we can so easily see in our imaginations about the boat tossed so much on the waves and Jesus coming and walking out among, among the waves to still the storm. So beginning with the 22nd verse in the 14th chapter of Matthew. Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, Jesus went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost! And they cried out in fear. 
But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when Peter noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me! Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus, Savior, pilot me over life's tempestuous sea. Unknown ways before me roll, hiding rock and treacherous shoal. Chart and compass I want to thank those who have provided pulpit fill in my absence for Peggy Bermudez and for Brad Lolliger. It was wonderful to be able to worship with you. I got to worship online with you live, and it's wonderful to have that technology to be able to join collectively with you even when I was not here. Both of them shed new light on passages, a different way to approach them than I had thought. I really appreciated Peggy and her kingdom, in the sense of rather than looking at it as a kingdom, thinking of a kingdom, our collective reality, it really opened my eyes to something new, or shoving back on Brad the passage he struggled with to have him come to his own revelations, his own awareness or appreciation of what it is trying to say, or how he at least was hearing it and sharing that with you. It has been wonderful to have different voices uh, and makes you appreciate just how much God's word touches each of us uniquely. Let us turn now to God in a moment of prayer. Lord God, may the meditations of my heart and mind and the words of my mouth be acceptable in your sight. 
May we hear your word afresh and may it inspire us anew. In Christ I pray. Amen. We all have those stories, those tales, those novels, those books that hook us in. Whatever it is about them. Now, Brad, who provided pulpit fill last week, he shared his volumes with you for those who are here or tuned in that apparently for him, those stories that hook him in are political in nature. And specifically, I guess he has an interest in LBJ and the five volumes that have so far been produced relative to his uh, political life. I know for my daughter, it's Harry Potter. And she has read all of those books and read them again and reread them and reread them and reread them so much that we actually sent the books on vacation and hid them away so that she would plunge herself into different stories and maybe find out there are other stories just as engaging as those. I have books myself that I've read and reread. Whenever I hear sirens, I have to take that moment just to think about that person who's responding to that call and the person in, in need. And I just saw the lights go by, so I hope everything is okay. But I have those things that I've read and reread. Probably you have things in your life that you've read and, and reread. My wife, The Diary of Anne Frank, I don't know how many times she has read and reread that, but it's been an important thing that she's turned back to at various moments with new revelations coming each time that you, that you take these on. I have read Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance I don't know how many times. I have read The River Y at least five times. I've read Once a Runner at least that many, if not more. And sometimes Leanne will observe when I'm looking for something to read before bed that one of these books comes back out and it's again? You know, but the stories, they hook us. And there are plenty of other things, of course, that I read relative to my vocation, to ministry, the biblical narrative, uh, and those that I indulge in as part of my pastimes and hobbies and interests. But my beach reads, you know, they have this term, the vacation reads, the beach reads. They're those, those things that you can pick up and chew through and then toss aside. My beach reads, my guilty pleasure, are those books which transpire upon the sea. The Cain Mutiny. Anybody remember the Cain Mutiny? That was Herman, Herman Wauk who wrote that. Cain Mutiny. The Perfect Storm. It was a book before a movie. The movie's a regular part of our rotation as well. The book is a, is a good one. There's a book called The Finest Hour, which then also got a movie made about it. If you've not read the book or seen the movie, they're both quite good. Uh, highly suggest it. Um, it's considered the, the best sea rescue by the Coast Guard ever on this tiny little, little boat off of Cape Cod. There was one called The Fate of El Moro. Another boat there's more sirens. Again, we'll think of those people being responded to. On they go. Somewhere in our neighborhood here. But I chew through these books. I chew through them like the storms that are the central character in some ways of, of these books. And the events that engulfed those those crews and those boats and the plight that befell them as it spills out like the water page after page. And I can certify that my daughter and wife are titanic fanatics. And so uh, some of these maritime disasters that I indulge in, I end up passing on and saying, well, I know you like Titanic, so here's another one about a boat that sinks. Maybe you want to read this too. And then we end up comparing and contrasting and a lot of sirens today. All going the same place. That was an ambulance, that one. But then we end up comparing and contrasting and examining and hypothesizing about captain errors and vessel issues and weather phenomena and deferred maintenance and crew mistakes and absent or missing safety devices, things that should have been there that there wasn't. One such book, which I read last summer, compared two different boats, same vintage, same manufacturer, same... Uh, area that they traveled through, same storm that they were caught in. Two different fates. Two different fates. And it attributed it to two very different captains and the choices that those captains made respective uh, in that circumstance. Now in Christian art long ago, when the faith and its followers were heavily persecuted, the church was depicted as a boat driven upon 
perilous sea is battered by winds and waves. And in these same depictions, Jesus is always in the midst of the storm somewhere, communicating through the art that even in the worst of it, there is nothing to fear. It affirmed that the one who brings salvation, the Son of God, would go with the church into whatever the storms were. Opposition, trial, challenge. And as it journeyed to new places, crossing to other sides, extending its mission to proclaim the good news, Jesus would continue to be with the people, the church. And so it would have nothing to fear, even in these lands and places and people and customs that were unknown to them. Now what interests me about this art which I really tried to explore a little more fully as I was approaching this passage, is there is never, it's never clear in the art who is the captain of the vessel. Now remember I said in the reading of these novels that I love, it's always generally about captain error and things of that nature. Well, it's never clear in this art who the captain of the vessel is. And in both stories that involve storms on the water that happen in Mark's gospel, waves and boats, one where Jesus is sleeping on the boat and then calms the storm, or this one where he walks through the midst of the storm out onto the sea, never is it revealed who is piloting the boat in those situations. Is it important? Now, I would say from my exploration and my indulgence, it is of critical importance who is piloting the boat. For they're the ones that have made decisions that have perhaps gotten them into those situations. But it clearly wasn't important enough to mention in either story. Now, we know that Jesus called Galilean fishermen to be disciples. We have the Zebedee brothers, that's James and John. They left their nets and followed. We have Andrew and Simon, Simon who becomes Peter, the disciple. Maybe it was one of them. They had familiarity with being out on the water. Likely, maybe it was one of them. Maybe who was the skipper is related to other arguments that they had about who was the favorite among them. But I wonder, as Jesus orders them away, as our passage started, he said, go and in, in, get in the boat and go to the other side. I'm going to dismiss the crowd. If there was any mention of the last storm that they were caught up in and who had been at the helm at that point, and they said, no, 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 no. You're not going to captain this time around. Was there mention of the one who steered them into that mess? Was there a claim that one of these guys could read the shoals and currents and weather better because of the experience on the water of the past, one of the Zebedee brothers or Andrew or Peter? Because I end up asking myself, why they set out into the middle? Was the boat of sufficient size to be in such deep waters away from the land? Was there any indication on the horizon of impending weather? Was the boat in, in good standing? Was it in good repair? These are all the questions I ask because of that guilty pleasure of reading through all the maritime disasters as my mind goes to all these questions that should have been asked and answered. Well, who cares? I do. And this is why a classic reality of the sea is the captain goes down with the ship. Now, if Peter, and I suspect, but I can't verify, now if Peter was the one that was captaining said boat, his getting off the boat shows a violation of this very notion of the last one off being the skipper, the one who's steering. Maybe his own fear and self-preservation had taken over, overruled, accepted custom as he is all too anxious to jump off and claim safety with Jesus rather than stay on the boat that's being tossed in the waves. It's a known fact that if someone is drowning, they can in desperation actually drown a rescuer if said rescuer does not secure them in a way that prevents them from flailing around and risking life to both. So in the art, as with the story, there is never a clear indication of who lies at the helm or guiding the tiller and the lack of an actual wheel. Rather, the art depicts all desperately working the sheets. That's a sailing term for the ropes, and I know nothing about sailing or whatnot. It all comes through this engagement with these novels. To reef the sails, which is to reduce down the amount of sail there is in the winds that are there, as the storm bears down. They 
appear clinging to the rigging and looking desperate to live. But it is unclear in all of it who, if any, are giving the orders, who is looking to steer them to safe harbor. Now, Jesus was a carpenter's son. He was landlocked in Nazareth. We can assume that his personal knowledge of the sea was therefore limited. Maybe his call of fishermen was prescient in the sense of knowing the troubles the church would face, the lands that it would expand to, the knowledge that was needed to read the currents of culture, the seas of the time, could be. But it's interesting that this land lover, in both cases, is the one who provides calm, who gives the leadership, who leads the boat and its passengers to safety. And maybe that's the point of it. Maybe that's the point. We're all so anxious to take control, like in the art, every person is pulling on some amount of rigging or sail, all desperate. When things get out of control or beyond our control, we're uncertain what to do, and we all pull different things, and we toss our respective vessels by doing that back and forth, and there's little progress made. We either rely totally on our own selves or and know how, or we squarely tie it to someone else, asking them to tell us what to do to fix what we can't see how to fix. Faith is about trusting something bigger and better and beyond. Faith is about anchoring ourselves to something stronger. And when Jesus says, have you still no faith? It's a question about our struggle on the seas of fear. And heaven knows we're on such seas now. Waves of uncertainty crashing over the edges of our lives. We don't know. We don't know about our health. We don't know about our security or or, our economic reality, our future, or what school's going to look like, or how we'll connect with others, or what weddings will be like, or when we can go back to the gym, or family reunions, or birthdays, grocery shopping, still weird, church. In all that turbulence and uncertainty, rather than looking to God, we rub our eyes, unable to catch a glimpse of anything in the midst of the storm and in desperation. We just want to get off. We want to do anything to change how things are and what things are. Now, faith doesn't take the storms away. Faith doesn't stop us from the fear when we look down upon the waves or have the wind whip in our faces. But faith does promise to be the hand in the midst of it all, to lift us back and place us together that we can pass through this collectively. Faith is that guide that teaches us and inspires us and challenges us and ultimately anchors us. Faith is our skipper, our captain, on the rough seas. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is in our midst. Maybe hard to see, to believe. We may feel like we're just stuck out in the middle with no hope, but I promise you, there is hope. Jesus is in our midst. Clear skies will return. People of faith have voyaged through challenges in the past, and the church hasn't always navigated the waters well, but it's never abandoned ship. And now is our time to navigate these waters, to know that the strength of our faith can withstand anything, to listen to that voice in the midst of it, to affirm our hope even in the worst of it. In these stirring unknown waters and blowing winds, the hand of God still reaches to us, always reaches to us. Jesus says, Be of good spirit. Have courage. Do not be afraid. For I am with you always. Let us pray. We find ourselves feeling tossed by the seas of our times, O God, filled with fear, not sure what to do. We look ahead, unable to see when, as soon as it feels like things are improving, another wave suddenly crashes over us. 
Help us, we pray. Help us to be connected, to listen to your voice, to have courage in the midst of the storm. And let your voice be our guide always. That voice that will lead us to safety and safe harbor. That voice of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. I'd invite you to join with me in affirming your faith among the seas that we travel this day together. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No. In all things we are more than conquerors through the one who loved us. We are sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Having heard God's word to us, let us then respond in our heads, in our hearts, with our hands, to take courage, to not be afraid. We remain committed as a community of faith to our vision in the midst of these storms to live our purpose of making connections and offering opportunities for faith, love, and service. Our collective support allows us to live this vision out, and you can do so online. There is a give heading at the top of our website that you can visit and give online or there are baskets here in the rear of the sanctuary if you came prepared to give in that way. But giving is more than simply the giving of our material gifts. It is also having heard God's word and having God's hand reach out to us, our response of taking hold of that hand. And so let us use this time to take hold of God's hand now.
Gracious God, we give you thanks that your voice comes to us among the challenging seas and the winds and waves and storms that we find ourselves in. It is hard sometimes for us to believe, but we pray that you would firm up our faith and find your hand there always to guide us to safety. So accept our gifts these days as a, as a way of our reaching back to you, our commitment of faith. Use them to your glory. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. courage. Do not be afraid, God says. And so let that peace of God enfold you. Let the strength and love of God uphold you, even in or especially in the midst of the storms. And may the wisdom of God control us.
as we navigate these waters. Take courage. Do not be afraid. Amen.